Welcome to Gaming Mechanics, a podcast that seeks to explore the unexplored topics in games, how they work, why they work, and why we love them. With me is Anonymous Raccoon. Woohoo! AKA... Trash Panda for today. <laughs> yes, Greg is our, our resident Trash Panda. And today we are going to continue our series on the transition in gaming between 2D and 3D, specifically focusing on what you might think are an unlikely pair of genres, platformers and racing games. But I swear to you, by the end of this, it will make total sense why we've combined those two. You might be wrong if you thought that. Yeah, no, it's... uh, Actually, I think this makes the most sense for our first... Outside of our intro from last week, for our first look at the specific genres, because I think... I think in, in our, our thinking and research, these would be the two platforms, or <laughs> the, the two oh. genres that got hit hardest by the, the 2D, 3D um, transition fundamentally in a lot of ways. Um, and that is, that's a big deal. Yeah, I would say uh, these two genres and then probably shooters would be the three that come to mind with like the, yep. the big changes that have happened. But uh, we're going to jump right on into some history here. I gave a very brief and a little bit of a sloppy history last time. I realize now that I've done a little bit more research, but hey, um, Uh, it it was an overview, and that's why we're doing a deep dive. Uh, Yeah, well, specifically on platformers, I just mixed up a couple dates, but we'll correct that. So uh, let's just jump in because we've got a lot of of history to cover. And and the reason, we're not just going into history for history's sake. I really think it's important for you to see the trajectory of how platformers came up and where they were going and then how disruptive 3D was. Because like what logically follows after after a certain point in (laughs) platformer history is like that they would have become more popular and and they would have taken over gaming basically. And the reason they didn't do that is because of 3D. Spoiler alert. But anyway, we'll get to that. (laughs) <laughs> so, um, really early on in platformers, the first game that people really would call platformers would have been, well, they wouldn't have called them platformers, but they do now, uh, were Donkey Kong yeah. and, and Space Panic. Um, the, there's a weird thing that happens in labeling where you don't really need to come up with labels until you have enough things to label. And so yeah. nobody called these platformers, but uh, later on, in fact... Uh, some magazines started calling them climbing games uh, when there was enough sorts of games like Donkey Kong, uh, and there was a, a small division between what the Brits called uh, platformers and what the Americans called climbing games. That's but uh, we basically we quickly got rid of the climbing games because the English are better at naming everything. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's just, mostly true, actually. What do we got? Uh, we have French fries, and they have crisps. Yeah, I, I, I it. think, yeah. Killed it. Yeah. Yeah. Chips. Anyway. Versus crisps versus cookies. Trousers. It's just confusing. I mean, pants. come on. Yeah. No one needs all those two words. It's it's really inefficient. Language is the yeah. worst. Anyway. Yeah. yeah we, <laughs> go we, should, we, we should stick with games. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is the reason we're not doing a... A language British podcast versus American English <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Surprisingly, the relationship between America and Britain did not change at all with the rise of 3D gaming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. put a nail on that. One. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really important from the outset. So we again started with games like Donkey Kong. Um, there was a really obscure subgenre of platformers, which was from behind. Um, that was it's it's the camera is behind your character and it's a little bit more in the vein of a racing game um, right. if you want to see an example of this uh, go ahead and look up antarctic adventure on youtube which to me just has a funny name because you know that somewhere there was there was a boardroom meeting where they were like guys we got to call this arctic adventure it would be way cooler and then there was that one guy who was <laughs> like, like no nah, man penguins nah, don't nah, live nah, in nah. the arctic yeah <laughs> <laughs> we so. need one more syllable for this title. <laughs> like, all right, come on. It's the end of the South Pole. Yeah. Yeah, that'd but, be a fascinating... <laughs> Our next series is game set in the Arctic versus the Antarctic. <laughs> the politics. <laughs> Why people pick the North or South Pole. Yeah. But uh, if you look up this game, you'll see that it's it's kind of like a racing game, except for there are pits and you jump. So yeah. like, and you can think about if if crash was set up so that you had to always move forward, which la- mm-hmm. in some of the levels it basically is because you have a boulder chasing you, right? But yeah. if it was set up that way, 
Like, it would feel very similar to a game like Antarctic Adventure. Yes, and that's in large part the big difference that, I mean, outside of the the introduction or the attempted introduction of depth, which, like we kind of mentioned last week, uh, was very difficult at first, and was a major problem on how to to figure out how to give players a good sense of of the Z axis. But that's in large part pretty much the difference. I mean, if like Sonic the Hedgehog, right, has those bonus levels where it, the camera rotates and then you're behind Sonic and you and you run forward. Um, and that's basically what a, what a 2D racing game was at that point. I, I like your differentiation that basically it was it was um, the later kind of 3D platformers without the ability to stop moving. You know, like you were always moving forward. Yeah. It was, it's far more about reaction time and um, kind of general spacing as opposed to something slower and more considered uh, the 3D platformers would become, which was more about kind of... Uh, precision of of jumping and and movement as opposed to speed necessarily um and so yeah it was really interesting even i remember uh, this is a throwback to anyone i never played sonic what i did play was a game called jazz jack Rabbit, which was in retrospect a ridiculously uh, transparent knockoff where you were a jackrabbit that moved really fast instead of uh a, a hedgehog. <laughs> instead um, of a hedgehog. which in some ways is thematically superior if you think about it um, but it also had shooting. It was, a, it was a 2D platformer with guns, basically. It was, it was oh, dude, look this up, man. It was awesome. It was it had this fantastic um, soundtrack and kind of like, it must have been early, early 90s or late 80s, um, but this weird animal-based aesthetic and like cyberpunk animal. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, Jazz like it was, it was it. maybe not cyberpunk, more like uh, 80s, like sci-fi-ish. It was really cool. Anyway, point is, they had the exact same thing, where you'd play the normal levels, side-scrolled, and then there'd be a bonus level at the end of each world, where you would, I remember literally the camera would start like that, and it would rotate, and it was a really cool idea. It was just, it wasn't actual 3D, but it'd mm-hmm. rotate, and then you would just have to run down the road and uh, and collect as many items as you could, basically, uh, and avoid, you know, there's, there's a time limit on it, too, and, and avoid certain other uh, obstacles, but, so that, but the, the fascinating thing is that that's a major crossover point, and that's why, in general, we're actually going to do racing with platforming right now is because those two were actually very, 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 very close um, pre-3D. Um, in fact, they were in large part identical in terms of when you think about the, the really core game mechanic being just having to move. Right. It's just um, positioning. As opposed to doing something. It's, it's literally positioning your sprite, your character, your avatar, um, and getting to the other side of the world as opposed to actually interacting with the world in, in any large way. So, Right. Let's go back to history, though. We got a little bit off track there. Yeah, so I think as part of history, it's really important to understand the limitations that were constraining the genre at the time. And yeah. so, because that's really what 2D versus 3D is all about, is the removal of constraints. And so yeah. the constraints early on with platformers... Uh, were the amount of sprites that could be rendered, which it's hard to believe that that was a constraint, but back in the day, Mm -hmm. it really was. Like, you think about even why we have floating platforms, part of that is because uh, they didn't want to render the base of the platform. Like, (laughs) they didn't... They didn't... So there was, like, the background layer, which, like, for the original Mario games, was just, like, blue. Like, the color blue. It was just a... And then there would be, like, maybe ten blocks in view at a given time. And that right. was that was that's because that's what the hardware could handle, and so yeah. you couldn't have had these like dozens of like really thick platforms with a lot of depth to them and, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, or intricate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you think about the original Metroid games, one of the reasons it's notorious now for this sort of cramped, mazy feeling, which I hated as a kid. I did never got into Metroid games. Yeah. But the reason why they were so cramped, um, it wasn't because they thought that would be a great design choice. It was because of the hardware limitations. They just yeah. they could only render this tiny little hallway at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Particularly you know, with what they were trying to do, because that was a little bit more... There are a lot of things you could do in Metroid, too. There was, there was, it was less just jumping and moving. Um, there was, like, kind of proto-combat. And, yeah. and, uh, and so, yeah, they had to fo- make the focus just... Which you see in terms of 3D games, too. I mean, it, it, it's just a different side of the same coin in terms of later. You know, you, you have, like, the really famous one being the Mists and Silent Hill. Um, those exist. One of the most famous parts of those. We talked about this in the horror cast a little bit, but the reason that Mist existed was because they literally couldn't render the world farther out, 
um, and they didn't have time in development to ensure they could. And so to cover up the fact that the world only existed like 20 feet away from you uh, in real time, they just put made everything misty and then would generate as you moved, um, which, of course, actually was super, super important for the feeling of claustrophobia and the, the aesthetic that uh, was so important for the horror in that game. So that was a, a fun little thing. But it's the, it's the same idea, just you didn't have the hardware to make the whole world in front of you. So. Yeah, you'd make it as you went along. So and there's actually, if you look it up, a really interesting game around this time called Alpha Waves. Um, it is actually an acid trip, um, which is <laughs> which is not actually, it's like not a, that far from the truth. Like it is based Whoa. on what it sounds like because it's trying to simulate uh, the production of alpha waves in of your brain waves, yeah. by playing sure. this game. So it is supposed to be kind of trippy, but it is a true 3D platformer in the sense of... Uh, a game like uh, Crash or Jack and Dexter. Um, right. It really, I mean, you're controlling like a triangle. So, uh, yeah. you know, don't get ready. You're not going to be shocked or anything. But this is a very early uh, true 3D platformer that was produced um, early on. So in some ways the technology was there, but it really wasn't popular. And there were too many constraints. Like uh, the hardware imposed so many constraints that really there wasn't anything too interesting to do other than make a triangle jump around to weird, trippy-sounding music. I mean, yeah, um, and when your main when your main like flagship franchise for a genre is just acid trip simulation, that tends <laughs> to not play as well with the, the kids. Right. As far as I understand it, <laughs> try to market that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your kids can trip balls this I Christmas. <laughs> oh, goodness sake. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. Ever so... tried drugs, kids? <laughs> now you don't Ever want to? to? <laughs> so, uh, continuing on with our history, those constraints about the limitations of sprite rendering were effectively removed in the generation of Super Nintendo um, and the Sega. Now, I realize they couldn't have rendered infinite numbers of sprites, but they could render enough to make a convincing platformer. Right. And so that's when platformers really came into their heyday. The limit to the, the main constraint that was hindering the genre was removed, and it blew up. I mean, it turned it. You got games like Sonic the Hedgehog, Super Mario World, Donkey Kong Country. Um, I mean, these are three beloved games with three beloved characters that continue to this day. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, those are considered some of the all-time greats, period, of right. games. And they could just crank these out. Like, people would, would snap them up instantly. There were s- several Sonic games, at least three Donkey Kong Country. Well, there were exactly three Donkey Kong Country games. But uh, mm. they, you had Yoshi's Island after Super Mario World, which was also just as successful. Like, right. It was almost like a no-brainer at this point, like, make a platformer. Like, yeah. And when, <laughs> if you were a big studio... Be- yeah, and the interesting thing, too, is, and we'll talk about this a little bit, too, with, with racing, but it's also around the time when you're seeing the big transfer from home sy- from arcade games to home systems. Right. And um, that's really important <laughs> because the idea of a long um, platformer where you had to be able to basically not be able to play it in one sitting or it wasn't designed, it was designed to be played single player only um, was really something that couldn't survive in the arcade market. Um, and it was very much for home systems. And so when that came about and those home systems became more the norm, suddenly that makes sense that you have a genre that is, one, similar to what people were used to in the arcades in terms of simple um, motion-based, you know, movement-based, location-based stuff as opposed to, you know, say, Legend of Zelda, which, of course, that's a whole separate story. But, um, but are now in the, the style of being able to be put down and picked back up have different worlds to have a different you know are designed to be played over weeks instead of hours um and so on and so forth so i think that makes a lot of sense even just just the social aspect of what was happening with games in that time period that those platformers would have been the most logical next step for the uh the home systems to be big banking in yeah I, you're absolutely right i hadn't thought about that but um classically home systems allowed for people to sit and play games and the, the people who developed the games didn't actually want people to beat them in one sitting like they wanted it to take a while because yeah, didn't that, want to beat them that was what set them apart from an arcade game and and yeah. if if you could just go to an arcade and play a game in one sitting why would you buy this multiple hundreds of dollars console to play it at home yeah. like 
it was expensive. <laughs> yeah, precisely. And I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, also arcades had one inertia behind them in terms of they were already the dominant platform, and two, the extremely potent social effect, which right. you know, obviously, we see came come full circle once online gaming became a thing and, and dominated um, gaming's trajectory. But you know, so, socialness, sociality is. I mean, I won't go too much into the psych side of it, but we are social beings by design to the point where if we are deprived of social interaction, that is roughly equivalent to being denied food or water. Um, it could actually kill people. And uh, so, so yeah, it, it makes total sense that that was such a powerful factor um, right. in the, the trajectory of, of games. So I'm going to keep going here on the history. We had the second gen, and this weird phenomenon comes up when you get characters like Sonic, Mario, and Donkey Kong. Um, people start using them as mascots. Like, right. we now take it for granted that these are the mascots for these games. Mega Man. Um, I'm trying to think of other people who've been famous mascots, but I guess Crash. I mean, like Rayman to an extent. On. Yeah, Rayman. Crash, yeah, Spyro. Crash. Different, different platforms and different studios had their platforming mascot and they really represented the company and said a lot about the company's image like sonic yep. was a little bit of a rebel um yep I, I i can't i guess mario was like more heroic and he was a good guy and he was just trying I mean, to mario like, save Japanese. the princess <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's true <laughs> i mean no, sonic was too but yeah. you know like he was he was just kind of a very classic like he, i don't know when you talk about the very Marios, honorable yeah, yeah, I guess. Were we talking about this before on cast, or maybe it was off of it, but just, like, when you try to, like, describe the Mario aesthetic, there isn't one. He's just, it's like, I don't know how to describe that <laughs> other than, like, it's not fantasy, it's not, I, I like, it's not sci-fi, certainly, it's not, like, I I, I don't know, what what's the aesthetic of, of Italian plumber <laughs> in Japanese game with various creatures that aren't real with some like dinosaur-esque stuff a large dragon turtle and then like medieval princess i, I have no idea like what <laughs> is, uh, it's fun to hear like, you my... try though i know thank you yeah no like i'm i'm literally trying my best and then if you look and then if you look at like what they've done with the series too and then you have like sunshine like you can put mario anywhere and it seems to make sense like yeah right. put him in a world without water and have him spread water around like that makes sense. put him in friggin' space for two games that everyone's fine with that. Uh, how about you know Mario Kart like racing makes tons of sense. Uh, give him a T Rex and Odyssey that's fine. Uh, like it, it literally there's no I don't know I don't know what the aesthetic is other than Mario like it defined its own aesthetic I guess. Yeah, they they made the aesthetic so like kind of confusing and nebulous so they can do anything with it. <laughs> I know. Like why Italian plumbers? Like why was that the why did Japan make their it's just a bizarre <laughs> Well there's that's a thing. I think I feel like that's probably a bigger discussion. He did have to have a mustache because they couldn't do a mouth. It would have looked true. like he was wearing lipstick and it would have been yeah, really yeah. weird. And it would have been really disturbing. But uh <laughs> I, but I don't still, man. There's there's more to talk about there for sure. Cause the mushroom, the toads. Much... What the fuck are toads? Who came up with that? <laughs> uh, Who put the turtle based enemy mm -hmm. system? All right, Shell, Greg, like, we gotta we gotta rein it in here. We gotta keep going right, on three D. <laughs> all right, sorry. It's just, it's I'm just it's a, weird. I'm having a moment. All right. I mean, I guess so... you do the same thing for like Crash. Won the world. Why did we pick a freaking Bandicoot for anyway? So in the in the next generation, so we had the mascotting, and then. The next generation of consoles are 3D capable. They can do 3D games. And you still actually do early on have a third generation of platformers. I'm, I've kind of been going through these by generations, but you can just think yeah. of them as the later platformers. And yeah. uh, games like Rayman came out, just strictly 2D platformer, very pretty game. Um, they actually do some parallax scrolling in the back where the background doesn't move as fast right. as the foreground. Very fancy. Right. Uh, you know, Mar the original Mario game would have could only dream of such cool effects with its blue background. Um, and also important, that actually is the very beginnings of depth. Um, the idea that things farther away move lower than things up close is part of the way the human brain perceives depth. Right. Um, so that's a, that's a very early beginning to actually going towards 3D, actually. 
And you also had games like Mega Man X4, which I love, but did not apparently do particularly well. Um, but it is a part, just straight up 2D platformer. It's very busy. Um, there's a lot going on. It's very action packed. Um, and I love it, that game too. It's more. That's uh, the only Mega Man I played. It really shirks the hardware limitations of games like Metroid, where you really could only have a couple enemies on screen, maybe. And, like, mm-hmm. the, you were in really cramped hallways where you couldn't see much. So, like, in Mega Man games, forget about it. Like, there's all kinds of stuff happening on the screen. Right. Um, and Mega right. Man X4 is, is definitely fits in that category. And okay. so these are these really refined, uh, very, basically unconstrained 2D platformers. Yeah. Um, and the height of that, that particular genre. Right, exactly. Like, all the limitations that were really hindering them were, were basically been removed. Um, and then... And then 19, uh, let me find the date here. I think it's 1996. uh, Mario 64 comes out uh, the same year as Donkey Kong Country 3. And Mario 64 does incredibly well. Crash also comes out this year, does incredibly well. Donkey Kong Country 3, the third game in a beloved series, sequel to uh, what people argue is the best of the Donkey Kong Country games, Donkey Kong Country 2. Um and it, it doesn't do as well as these other two games. And I think that's a real inflection point where 2D platformers go on the decline and 3D platformers, um, which are really honestly more in the vein of a game like Antarctic Adventure, um, yep. are be- be come to the forefront. And here we are. Well, and the interesting thing, too, is that... So we were talking about... And I we didn't actually do, I guess, the entire necessary like, work for, for this. But as we said before, it seems like, at least in terms of just this simple look at the popularity, or at least the mascots, or the most talked about games, the platforming genre was kind of the, the top thing, right? That's where, that's where companies put a lot of their uh, time and effort to develop their characters and their image. And, and it was kind of the, the place to be for games. Um, and then the interesting thing is then right after this, we'll look at, uh, you know, the first 3D consoles in N64 and uh, the PlayStation. Um, and you have or at least the first kind of truly 3D ones. They're obviously pseudo 3D before that um, with the SNES and, and all that jazz. But, um, and you see a major shift in the most popular games. Um, they're no longer the platformers. In fact, there's almost none of the platformers in the top Ten of, I mean, it's not. Let's just go through the um, the sixty four games real quick. We have uh, Super Mario sixty four, three D platformer. Uh, Mario Kart, not Golden Eye, 007, obviously. Uh, Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time, Super Smash Bros., Pokemon Stadium, uh, DK sixty four, Diddy Kong Racing, uh, Star Fox, and Banjo Kazooie. So out of all of those, we have what like tops that are top ten. Yeah, that's top ten. Let's see here. Yeah. And then if you look at the PlayStation side, we have the top ones, which I found this very interesting. We have Grinch Rizzo being number one, um, which is, uh, that was also bundled with the original PlayStation, so that kind of gets a pass, but regardless. Um, number three is Grand Turismo 2, so it was obviously very popular anyway. Um, Final Fantasy VII was number two, and then we're on to four. Tekken, um, the Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone port. It wasn't even a port. It was just the, the version. Uh, Tomb Raider, Final Fantasy VIII, Crash Bandicoot, Tomb Raider 2, and then Metal Gear Solid. Um, so in those, we only really have Crash. Um, Tomb Raider, kind of. That was more of a combat exploration platform. Um, and then... Uh, and yeah, and then Metal Gear Solid was definitely far more stealth. So in large part, the really real platform you had there was Crash in the top ten. Yeah. And and both, I think both consoles tell the same story, like that that two D side scrollers were sort of you know so nineteen ninety five basically. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, totally. The N sixty four, the PlayStation does a little bit better with this because, especially with the Mega Man series, but the N sixty four famously only has uh, four two D platformers, um, yeah. and they they were mildly successful. Yoshi's Story. Um, it's probably the most successful and known of of those. Kirby sixty four right. and the Crystal Shards or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Go, Goemon's Great Adventure, which uh, it, yeah, it's pretty obscure. I've never heard of. <laughs> yeah, M- Mischief Makers, which apparently did well the year it came out, but it has kind of been forgotten by gamers. Right. So like that's it. Like for the life of the console, 
which is crazy because the Super Nintendo is like mostly platformers. Like a right. lot of the games are platformers. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's got to be at least 20 to 30% of the games. Yeah. Even a studio, I think, like, so this impacted studios differently, and Rare uh, famously made the Donkey Kong series. They mm-hmm. they continue making games for the N64, but they make GoldenEye, and, and this is in order of popularity. Donkey Kong 64, trying to move their beloved franchise to the third dimension. Diddy Kong Racing, again, trying to do the same thing, and Banjo-Kazooie. And so they, they don't make any 2D platformers uh, for, the, for that yeah. whole console. And we begin to see a shift from the 2D, 3D platformers away from the just get through this level design where literally the whole game is just getting to the end of the level. If you can do that, you're successful. Right. Into something resembling a little bit more collectathon, what we'd call it nowadays, with Banjo-Kazooie, DK64. Yeah, um, tons of collection there. Uh, obviously, what was that? Yeah, there's a ton of collection in those games. Yeah, exactly. Or Super Mario 64, where it's less about getting to the end of the I mean, it still is about clearing worlds and getting to the level grabbing something in large part Mm -hmm. but there's also all kinds of other things to get also the the 3d environment means that it's not linear necessarily anymore um and there's there's less a need for speed of completion um it's far you it's less being able to do these really really intricate jumps at at the correct times as much as maybe being able to line them up correctly um Mm -hmm. it's a little bit slower pace um in that way uh and that's that's a really interesting just I think side effect of 3D shift was that now the goal is less you have a, a third dimension to be with both literally and you know kind of physically or uh, um, <sighs> metaphorically I guess in terms of <laughs> being able to have more goals right for the you, you don't you suddenly can't you can go somewhere other than up and down and left and right um, so there's more things you can ask your player to do. And uh, and that becomes far more the norm, I think, moving forward. Certainly, with, I mean, you, there's some exception where like Crash Bandicoot is in large part still going to be getting to the end of the level, but even that changes as as that game series develops. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, similar with Spyro the Dragon, Spyro Collectathon E, then finished the levely. Um, the <laughs> worlds were more open, less linear. Uh, same thing with Croc. You had a bunch of things to collect. Um, so. Yeah, I mean the the linearity I think is is the main thing that kind of goes by the wayside with a lot of these games, and, and I yeah. think that's a that's a, a great point. One of the things that that really was kind of trippy to me as I was researching this was the thing that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, which is that this genre didn't really it didn't get invented by 3D. Like, it was kind of around in games yep. like uh, Alpha Waves, in games like uh, Antarctic Adventure, and it wasn't as um, nonlinear. It was still very linear, um, mm. and the 3D really enabled it to be more exploratory, and I think that's yeah. why it, it really took over the platforming genre to the point where people would look at Mario 64 and they would say, well, obviously, the, 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 the predecessor to Mario 64 is you know Super Mario World it's just been shifted right. into the third perspective but there are actually other games in 2D which more closely resemble Mario 64 than that and th- and that was weird to me because we would call yeah. both of those platformers and these other games you would maybe I don't really know what you'd call them they don't they're su- such an obscure subgenre now it's yep. kind of like I, yep. yeah I, I don't it's difficult like that. to even kind of collect into one that's a really good point though the the differentiation between subgenres was was pretty extreme actually in some ways you know, like mm-hmm. there is there is very, very separate, despite, you know, having similar maybe mechanics, um, there are very separate goals um, in terms of the design philosophy of and what the player had to do. And that obviously got changed dramatically with uh, the 3D inclusion. It's also interesting that, I mean, we'll, we'll get into this in a sec too, but there's the one basically one out just due to 3D. Like, it, it's not that, and, and we've seen, again, like, about this a little bit we've seen kind of a renaissance a little bit recently of of 2d games um side scrollers like you know or in the blind forest or shovel knight or uh, hollow knight or uh, uh get over getting yeah. over it is a is a very recent one uh, i don't know if you've heard about that game getting over it yeah, yeah. <laughs> did we do we talk about it? oh my god that i don't know if we can quite count that but <laughs> it's not a platformer but it's 2d i mean mount your friends similar oh my uh, gosh 
Do you do you know that game? Don't look that game up. I I have um, played. I own that game. Oh, do you? <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Anyway, point is, um, that the there's nothing. Again, we kind of talked about this, but there's nothing inherently better. I think about a lot of the 3D shifts. Um, 2D games were at a pinnacle at that point, right? And we were yeah. getting these really wonderful games in terms of where Sonic was at, Mega Man, and um, and, and then those just stopped entirely, right? Um, we right. could talk about the, the shift for Sonic, and we talked about this a lot last week, actually, in terms of the shift for Sonic from 2D to 3D. Mm-hmm. Um, but in large part, a lot of them were not too smooth. And, uh, and that's just really interesting. 3D won out, I think, just because of it being new a new technology a new uh a new selling point maybe a new it was just the, the hot thing and everyone had to do through regardless of the quality of the game yeah i think it, it definitely was the the cool thing to do to to render your game in 3d like and and it makes me wonder about games like rayman and even Mega Man x4 um, right. and if actually five and six were the same way and these were i think six was for the playstation 2 like we're like well into uh-huh. the 3d revolution here and people are still uh playing Mega Man games as, as 2d games which is really shocking to yeah. me but um well it's interesting too because so we'll sorry go ahead I, I just was gonna say they must have had a real cult following in order to continue making that those games yeah and this gets to so then this is going to be another similar theme and we talked about this last week again but the idea of of you know 3d versus 2d um it, we've, we've obviously this week just been talking about the gameplay mechanic part of it as opposed to rendering something in 3d despite it having 2d uh gameplay right still being on on rails um and so i just want to take a second and, and talk about that because there is some this gets a little bit trippy here for a second um but just in terms of the way we perceive 3D actually, 3D is in fact uh, a perception, right? Like even with our as as humans, our visual eyes work, we actually are getting basically a 2D image reflected onto the back of our of our corneas, um, and then the brain takes those images and then constructs a 3D image through them, right? It's it's very much it's post processing. Um, if you just took the absolute input from your eyes, then that is still a, a 2D thing it's a, think of a, a screen right um and there's all these different things that the brain uses to construct this kind of three-dimensional perception of the world around us via shades via color via um, motion um via distance and perception or uh not perception i'm assuming that's part of it um uh, perspective um and uh, relative sizes and relative to each other it's all these kind of after effect things that go in. But the reality is that we do actually have a 2D picture that's getting converted into 3D by our brains. So it gets even trippier when you think about, right, a screen is also 2D that we're looking at. Um, and there are all these, like I said earlier, like with the, um, I think it was the Rayman example, um, where the the background was moving relative, different relative to the foreground. That, right. Like I said, that's a very normal way to perceive that something's farther away from you um, with relative sizes. And... Uh, in large part, that's the same thing that is being taken advantage of with, with 3D games. Um, they're just utilizing those more um, and the ability to use you know, multiple polygons and actual kind of Z space in the game gives you more of a sense. It's, it's basically utilizing more of those things that our brain normally uses um, and putting it into the game already so that we don't have to, to trick ourselves to thinking it, it is that way, right? right. Um, actually constructing a 3D environment and then utilizing those same cues um, in the game, which will make it a lot easier for the brain to to immerse itself and put itself into that um, into that place. So I know it's it's that's kind of trippy. We were talking about this earlier, and I was like, oh my lord, that is there's multiple levels of abstraction here. Yes, <laughs> there's both the image that is being projected into our eyes. There's the image on the screen that is going to be projected onto our eyes. Um, there's the like suspension of disbelief that we're supposed to be projecting ourselves into on the screen to be able to feel like we're in and moving at 3D, which is already a, a completely like constructed idea of VR brain. It's 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 weird. It's crazy. It's cool. Um, yeah, it's pretty it's, it's pretty incredible that we can perceive the world in 3D around us. Actually, when you think about it, like even the fact that there's like a, a differentiation between a game that looks 3D in the context of the game world versus a game that actually you perceive having depth. As yeah. like a, as yeah. like in the true three D movie sense of the word, 
Right. Like, even just the fact that there's a distinction there is super trippy. Like, oh yeah, that your brain can t- can know that something is 3D looking, but mm-hmm. isn't actually experienced as 3D is like can demonstrates there's some weird stuff going on here. <laughs> and all this that we're talking about, I think, is why the switch for platformers was so major. And same thing with racing games, because like I said, it was very much just placing something in space as opposed to interacting with things in space. Um, it, all of these different kind of trippy dynamics in the way that the brain works were just getting taken advantage of, basically, um, and being able to be utilized and, and manipulated for, you know, obviously in good ways for fun. Um, and that was, that was new and fun, and, and you didn't need much more than that, actually. Um, and I think that's why the, the switch between 2D and 3D was uh, hit so much harder with these games than with, say, fighter games um, or... Um, I mean, shooters obviously is another huge one, like we talked about, because that's just a that's just fundamentally a very different different thing. But um, but yeah, I mean, puzzle games, uh, say like combat, um, like adventure games, um, RPGs, turn based. That took a long time to really develop into a really separate thing. Where you see this really quick switch with platformers mm-hmm. um, from a very fundamentally different game to a or a different play style. Um, very, I think there quickly. was a lot of weight on platformers to pioneer this space too, because they really were the flagship uh, characters for those platforms. And so people, everybody wanted to see Donkey Kong in 3d. Everybody wanted to see Mario in 3d or Sonic. Like it was what people wanted. And there was Mm -hmm. a lot of weight because they had spearheaded the innovation of platforming in the previous, um, consoles and then in the mm-hmm. new consoles it was expected that they would pioneer 3d space but It'd it was kind of a here. weird transition well let's uh let's transfer into racing games then let's in the moment it. um because that is like i said very much i feel like these two really run together in terms of again being entirely space-based racing games are different in terms of even in terms of of uh what we're talking about with with um speed basically the fact that you're always going to be moving in a racing game Mm-hmm. Um, that is fundamentally different from platformers, and it's if as Mario you can stop. I mean, you still have usually a time limit, and it's still kind of completion time based. But racing games are like, literally. I mean, I'm pretty sure with early racing games there was no way to even stop. I mean, there's a minimum speed you had to be going, and the world would move around you, mm-hmm. basically. Right? That was like the also the other classic thing about even old, early handheld games where you would your your car was kind of at the bottom of the screen, and it wouldn't really move. Actually, you could kind of move its position. Um, but basically the world was moving around you, right? The world was like coming towards you if it was from behind. Um, right. and that's, that's the way that 2d gear racing games were. And like I said, that really is basically the same thing as a platform. I think that's why we didn't see those from behind platformers. Cause it's basically racing games. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it makes way more sense in, in a racing context, like being a penguin that's yeah. jumping over holes in the ice. I, I, it's just not as cool as like driving a yeah. race car. I mean, uh, yeah, totally. And <laughs> particularly when you think of, I mean, I would imagine that was like a big part of, you know, car like cars in the in the late seventies was a very uh, like racing culture. I think was just kind of coming about in some ways, and that was a much easier marketing thing to do. Really, again, when we go back to arcades, um, I think it's another huge thing with racing games that was very important and and a reason that we saw them. Um, be so much more popular. Like, racing games are very niche now. Basically, you only see them in context of super realism um, mm-hmm. and uh, racing simulators, which they did not start as by any means. Um, back in the day, they were far more, obviously, arcade because we only had arcades. But I think a big reason they were so much more popular back then was because of the also the unique social aspect of racing games, that racing games are only fun when you're obviously racing against someone else. Um, and that was custom built for arcades, the social aspect there. Um, yeah. Racing games are a lot less fun when you're just playing them by yourself, in my opinion. And it, uh, so to literally both bring in that level of it's something that is, is very, very easy to immerse yourself in. Um, I think immersion is really important for racing games. It's very easy to put yourself in a car um, and pretend that you were in a car because you could do that in an arcade. Mm-hmm. Um, as well as it was competitive, right? It was You almost always saw the arcades the consoles would have two linked up at least two or three at least and it was never just one booth and yeah, we, uh, we don't and really naturally fun too I, do, I don't quickly reach for racing games as like pioneering the like large scale multiplayer space but yeah. really like if you think about it how many people can play a racing game simultaneously 
Like, right. it's almost, like, infinitely scalable. Right, and, all of them. And you all can Basically. enjoy the game at the same time because of the way that the... I mean, that's how real races work. So, like... Yeah, I don't, yeah that's the point. It's in, yeah. the, it's in the name. It's between two things. <laughs> right. It's not just a time trial. It's an actual race between two things. And... Uh, Especially later on in the in the arcades, like they would get new hardware where you would be actually like sitting with a steering wheel. It wasn't just a joystick anymore, and they, yeah. these rigs would just get increasingly complex around racing games. Um, one of the really early influential racing games is Pole Position, um, which I think most people have heard of, and mm-hmm. it it does predate uh, even Arctic Adventure, um, yep. and it has checkpoints and and it's it's identifiable as a racing game basically it's it's the predecessor um yeah very very early on i would say most of the advancements in racing games come from making it more like racing in real life um yeah and so you can see why uh, a switch from having only 2d hardware to having 3d hardware would be a really big deal for a genre that is the primary differentiator between uh, the first game and the second game or between two different studios is right. how realistic this game is. Yeah. Yeah. Be- and precisely for that, when we're talking about like immersion, like you, you even said with the hardware idea, right in an arcade, you did have these big rigs. Like you said, it wasn't just like a joystick and some buttons that you were standing at. Like most other arcade games, you'd actually sit down in a big chair and there'd sometimes be vibration built in. You'd sometimes have a, have a stick shift. You have a literal steering wheel and you'd have pedals. And that was a very, very easy way to immerse someone in a in a game because you're just you're in a car and cars are actually pretty easy to, to simulate in a in a situation like that you can't really do that with like you know a platform like how do you make someone feel like they're in uh, a mario world i mean or or with a fighter right like how do you make someone inside a street fighter it's a lot lot more difficult um but right. with racing games it was actually kind of already built in it was very very easy to do um i think for that reason there is so that that immersion thing like we said is already so important so 3d would only enhance that in the 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 inclusion of polygons the ability um have different shades and light and and really begin to give a sense of speed um, right easier than it was with just kind of 2d sprites Um, that obviously would be the the direction to go and and the most important part of it and that's exactly what we've seen like i said all the way up to all the big race innovations tend to be just real i mean it's a series like that has been f- almost close to photorealistic for like a few years now like it, it's remember the early like four those top ones and it's partially because cars are easy to, to and do they're not too complex because there's only a few moving parts good lord the forza games are staggering like there's there's shots of them now i legitimately cannot tell from reality um so that's definitely the the kind of course the the track of racing games has been just kind of that movement towards realism and immersion yeah when you were describing the uh the arcade setup like with uh, the shifting sticks and the steering wheel and yep. we were talking about that earlier like just the idea that you really only that there's already being in a car is already a mechanical <clears throat> abstraction for the world right like right. you are controlling <laughs> a lot of things yeah. that from a very simple position like you yeah. can't you can't deal with a really complex control scheme when you need to react to stuff at 70 miles an hour so yeah. your hands are in the right place your feet are in the right place and that's pretty much it so yeah. like you and, and i think that's very easy to simulate because the hard work has already been done like people yeah. who designed cars already figured out how best for people to interact with the world when they are in, in a metal space. box careening down a pavement like, yeah, I mean, that's the whole point of cars is just to move physically, move you in space, which is the exact idea of like what we've been talking about these platformers, these right. these location based games. It's just how to maneuver in the world. And you're right, we already did that. We figured that out. Right, the best way to do that. When we were really <laughs> moving people. I know exactly. In reality, actually. And Fascinating. and um, I think where these two genres really, you can kind of see um, why the transition really benefited one and kind of confused the other was. Mm-hmm. You're simulating something realistic in a racing game. Yeah, there is yeah. no simulation for a 2D platformer, especially a 2D platformer. Like it's just, right. it doesn't even make sense. Try to, like, right, like the like <laughs> kind of, like if you like in a true, if you had a really true simulated like, real world 
called just a human trying to run around, that's not as fun to play, actually. In fact, I mean, like, you can think, like, like you mentioned, like, Mirror's Edge, like, Assassin's Creed. Both mm -hmm. those are even, like, way, like, that's obviously not how, like, if you really did a straight-up human simulator, it would not be too exciting to, like, move him around, you know? Yeah, like, those games simulate, like, superhumans with, like, crazy agility and perfect balance. Like, right, exactly. They are not normal humans. <laughs> yeah, precisely. You, no, one, no one actually wants to, to do that. So, yeah, the move towards realism for platformers wouldn't have worked. It wasn't helpful um, to do, right? Like, that's, that's not the point. And uh, that's a really good point, actually, that the 3D immersion, the 3D, if it was moving things towards, in, in one sense, making them more realistic or making it easier for things to be more realistic, it didn't benefit platformers, actually, because that wasn't, no one asked for that, no one wanted that, because um, it's not, that's not fun, it's not the point, um, as opposed to racing was the exact opposite. Yeah, that's exactly what people were car. asking for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, and, and feeling like you were more in a car and moving really quickly and, and being able to pass people and... Uh, you know, take turns really hard. Now, you know, you see the the <laughs> inclusion. This goes a little bit forward into 2002, but like going to like the um, the burnout series mm -hmm. where you it's less about racing and more about like blowing up your car. You know, <laughs> like the really really realistic crash sequences. Right. Um, was super super fun for people to do. Uh, Heck, and, I, re and I remember so, crashing my car in Need for Speed and thinking that was a riot. Yeah. Just like watching yeah. it flip over like a thousand times. And oh, totally. I mean, just <laughs> physics. Or yeah, like Need for Speed, the original, the Hot Pursuit had cops. Right. Um, the idea of yeah, having to get the cops didn't have any ability. They literally would have to ram you off the like spin you. They'd have to like hit the back end of your car um, right behind you and try to spin you out and then mm -hmm. and stop you. Um, which is kind of how that works, actually. So there's there's another interesting. So as we've been talking about this kind of versus non immersion and how it helped with racing more so than platforming. The other interesting thing is there was another tiny sub. Ooh, this is really interesting. The fact that there was a subgenre of less realistic racing that branched out um, in the early '90s and then died out in large part, um, which was like kart racing, um, super right. arcadey, right? The idea of very very low realism um kind of power-ups it's a lot slower in general than the the kind of need for speed gran turismo forza series um but it did allow one it was it was super super social super fun um and and really simple but two it also allowed in the 3d world um something more more than just a linear track where you were going to be going to the end of the track um and being done that you see the introduction of like derby combat actually um, which would be just about impossible in 3D from behind, at least. You know, you could you could have like the like old, um, oh boy, what are those called? They're they're old like Destructo Derby games where it was just kind of like from the top down, and you all control the car and you kind of would like drive through it like that. But from behind, from like first person, third person, um, that was pretty much impossible in 2D. Um, and uh, there was a lot more uh, innovation that actually happened in that area, I think. Um, yeah, because, because of the fact that you didn't just have the realistic side of things, you now had all these different kind of crazy, wacky dynamics you could introduce to it, and it gave a bunch of new um, gameplay mechanics. Right. Like, where was everybody spending their efforts in between uh, Turismo 1, Gran Turismo 1, and Gran Turismo 2? Like, all of the effort was going toward making it more realistic. Like, they weren't thinking about, right. like, how can we add an interesting gameplay dynamic? It's like, no, the right. thing that's oh, going to totally. sell this game is that, you know, now the trees look better and the track looks better and the cars look better. Like, that's yeah. that's yeah. the thing that's going to sell this game. Yeah. And and, uh, and more custom. I mean, that was one thing that, you know, Grand Trismo did was customizability to begin actually, like, changing parts in your car and selecting different tires, which, again, is far, you know, that's, that's the way real cars work, too. That's that's part of racing. Is right. being able to make the build good. Um, you don't have that much in... Uh, in the original, you know, Mario Kart, Crash Team Racing, or Diddy Kong Racing, um, you have another, it's another return to mascots, actually, where suddenly you're back into the, the realm of kind of branding, um, another place to be able to throw all of your most popular characters and have people play as them, um, right. kind of like the Smash series. Yeah, the Smash series and the, and the Mario Kart series, I realized that Mario Kart was also uh, on the Super Nintendo platform, but... I wonder if it was kind of a way for, uh, I guess, for the mascots to get a little bit more exposure when people weren't quite sure what to do with them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for, no, for, no, seriously. 
particularly in that age, like you said, of platformers were in a really weird place and we had to change things and, and figure out what they were going to do. Um, and and to your, still throw them into, yeah. To your point about kart racing um, kind of falling off, I went ahead and just pulled up like a list of, of uh, kart racers that have come out and mm-hmm. tried to find recent ones that aren't Mario, because obviously the Mario Kart series is going strong. People right. love Mario Kart. Right. But, like, you have to realize, for a while, everybody was making kart racing games. Like, there was Crash Team Racing, there was there was yep. a Looney Tunes Racing, there's Diddy Kong Racing, oh, yeah. there's... Anyway, there's a ton of these. There's... Uh, but, but none of them have come out, really, in the last ten years. Like, um, yeah. anybody ever played I'd Eminem? I'd say that probably died out. Eminem Kart Racing, anybody? <laughs> 2007? Very popular. Yeah, um, yeah. Classic. Coco and they tried to keep it up too, like you know, like CTR did. Then they did like Double Dash, um, and they did uh, uh, Nitro um, for the PS2. Um, let's see here, what else? There's like, yeah, it is interesting that Mario. I mean, I think in large part just because it was the most popular and the name really. We have a whole generation of kids that grew up playing it. You know, that's that's going to kind of keep it going. But yeah, it's a large part that whole genre has died. Right, you're not seeing a lot of development dollars being poured into that. Right. Despite the fact that it actually would work well in terms of the social, like it would take really well to online play, right? Um, yeah. In the online area, so. super super easy. And yet, and yet it's we don't see that. Been done. There's only so far you can take. Uh, I feel like that that idea to, um, in terms of the different mechanics, it seems really difficult to continually iter- iterate on. Um, yeah. To keep on trying to push forward as a genre and i think that's true about like racing games too like just vanilla yeah. racing games like you mentioned right, that like sure. forza is hugely popular um right. but like there aren't a lot of other like r- racing as a genre is not really popular right now uh, people yeah. aren't yeah. all talking about their favorite racing game and i think it's because the genre has mostly been done like yeah. people have made the games that wanted to be made in the genre and now they're kind of looking for areas where there can be a bit more innovation and creativity applied. And racing, mm. uh, as as they are classically understood, these racing games are sort of over-constrained. Like, it's very clear what mm. you're trying to do. It's it's more like a simulation. You're just trying to do make an open-world racing game. Yeah, exactly. Like, it doesn't even make sense. Um, yeah. It would become kind of something else. Like, you could have an open-world game with cars. Um, right, and then you're a GTA, basically. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much the way you get with that. Uh, yeah. But so it's interesting. Like three D was really good for this for the racing genre, um, and it, it led to a ton of different of competition between studios who were trying to make these really realistic games. But then right. once the the winner was declared, or or once the the Gotta graphics, were, mass. yeah, once the graphics mm-hmm. were good enough, like the competition kind of stopped because yeah. kind of anybody could make a good racing game, make a game that looked good. I'll say. But that isn't what made the racing game good anymore. Like, just having it looked good wasn't enough. And so the, yeah. thing, the thing that actually kept people um, attracted to a racing title became the reputation. And so that's why yeah. Forza now is just dominant in the, in the realistic racing community because it yeah, has a good it. reputation. Yeah, and, and I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. Like, if there's a half-life on game genres for... A generation or a council or not even a council but a a technology like yeah we've kind of it's potentially we've discovered and and found all the best ways to make racing games work with our current technology um in 3d and like what's the next step going to be like vr right like maybe we'll see a resurgence of race can you imagine getting to race in vr that'd be a fantastic yeah that'd be a really again low-hanging fruit um Mm -hmm. to really make you feel like you're in a you're, you're moving i mean that's that's basically actually what current like vr like rides do right is they try to give you a sense of motion and 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 movement um and trick your brain into thinking that you are moving really fast when you're not um so that's i think that's again really i think the beginning of these new technological jumps tend to be just placing you in space as opposed to interacting with things and uh and that's what racing takes really well too so i think platformers right Um, so i wonder if that as vr gets more and more mainstream um if that'll be something we'll see more of, that people will be excited about the new VR racing games. Like, have you tried this? Sk- felt felt how it made you feel again, you know? Like, when it, when you first went back to the 3D games and played Need for Speed and felt like you were going so fast again, you know? Yeah, because what you're simulating is in itself fun, 
Like yeah. it's just yeah, you don't need it, to it's, add an, on. Yeah. it's an easy port to any new technology because yeah. all you have to do is go back to the original experience, gather more data, and put it in the new technology. And yep. like now you have something fun to simulate because people snare. love driving yep. fast cars. And like with the rise yep. of self-driving cars within the next you know decade or twenty years, like mm -hmm. getting to drive a car at high speeds could be a really people unique do experience. That. Like you won't be driving. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. That's an interesting. This this has been this whole subject of just perception and the way that plays in is a really interesting thought. Maybe we could do an episode on this later of the idea of like just how people. Just yeah, the 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 realm of simulation versus, um, like how how simulating games should be basically. Um, mm -hmm. We've we've touched on that before here and there, particularly with horror. Um, right. But that is as technology moves forward, it just gets technology gets better at simulating reality, and for games that really thrive on being closer to reality or making you feel closer to something. Um, that's really good for games that aren't like that then it's not necessarily as big a jump that's why vr i don't think has exploded in the way that it like 3d did at the time you could kind of port everything into 3d it's really hard to actually transfer a lot of things into vr um it you, vr can't do anything better than than the current generations of of action games or adventure games or shooters can do you know right uh, yet anyway so and I, I think I want to touch on that point again uh, that you just just mentioned, which is like it made so transition from 2D to 3D made things that could be simulated or were closer to simulations a lot more attractive and more yeah. popular. Um, but I think there, there's a part of me that's sad for like what's lost in the the creativity, at least for a time, of the yeah. 2D the 2D platform. Um, in general, but also 2D platformers in specific. Like, mm -hmm. it requires thinking out of the box to con conceive of a 2D space where a character lives, because that's not our yeah. world. And yeah. the closer that we are able to simulate 3D space and our world, the... it, it is, I don't want to say it's less creative, but <clears throat> I think it it's... It takes less out... Yeah, it takes less linear think, or, or it takes less kind of lateral thinking. Right. You know, it's like, more intuitive. It makes more sense. Exactly. Like, you can borrow more elements from the real world. Like, you you couldn't borrow too many elements to make Mario. Like, the idea of jumping, but, like, gravity's <laughs> even off. Like... Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, no, you really had to think outside of the box to make a game like that. Whereas a 3D game, there's just... There's a lot of things that we intuitively understand about how 3D space works. And, like, how right. physics works and everything that do constrain you. And I think create constraints can breed creativity. But um, totally. anyway, I just hope that we don't we don't ever forsake 2D space because I think that there are just unique, interesting things that can be done there, and mm. and it's it's clear that th that just moving a game <clears throat> simply from 2D to 3D is it's not really possible. Like it just it changes the game. Um, yeah. For a yeah. game, you can't just yeah. for a game like Mario, like for games like racing games, it, it does actually doesn't change the game too much. I don't think yeah. anybody's really lamenting the loss of 2D graphics. Um, for racing games, yeah, that's a good point. Like there's, there's been no retro 2D racing games that people are like, oh yeah, this was great. Yeah, like remember how cool 2D racing games were? I played tri tried playing like the original Mario Kart a couple of years ago, and yeah. I lasted like 15 seconds before I wanted to hurl. Like, yeah, <laughs> it was it was so. I was yeah, like, no, how so did I really play this? Yeah, totally. And and it's le and it's less about just like hey, it's a game, and more about the fact that like. It, it was really well done. Like, a lot of times you play older games and they just weren't up to par on some mechanics. You know, like, if you think about, like, vanilla World of Warcraft, right? Like, that it, it wasn't that it was a worse game. It's just we hadn't figured out that genre yet. Like, I think it, people had figured out racing games. It was just, there's literally a hardware function there. Right. Like, it's not like you could go back and redo that game better, you know, um, in 2D. It would just be, no, it's just the, the way to iterate and make that better would be Mario Kart 64. Like, <laughs> that's... Yeah. That's the only way to have that happen. Yeah, that's that's true. Like, and and I think that that ties again back to the fact that it's a simulation. Like, yeah. it it was it borrowed from something that was already figured out because people were really racing, and so yeah, yeah so totally. It, totally. Yeah, no, that was a thing. That's a that's a great point. Whereas a, great point. a, uh, a console platformer wasn't figured out because it doesn't mirror anything in the real world that we had already been iterating on. Yeah, um, nothing, nothing close. Which begs the question: How, how, yeah, the the creative process there that that it was had to be very creative, actually, right? That it's more 
or like you said, in terms of this different space where we're not really simulating reality, but we have to come up with a new system of interacting with the world that people are going to find fun and engaging. Um, and I think that's why you saw these super creative, I mean, like, again, like, I was talking about aesthetics, right? Like, to be fair, there's actually a lot of games like that, like Crash Bandicoot. What kind of aesthetic is that? It's, like, weird animal, crazy scientists. Like, there's humans, and there's, like, tiki masks, and there's, like, tro- like tropical yeah. themes. It's, like, tribal. Like, I don't know what that is. And... Yeah, tr- and, and then, and then or, like, Spyro the Dragon, right? You have, like, weird dragon-esque kind of cartoon fantasy uh, thing with all kinds of other animals involved as well. Um, we went through a phase of a lot of, you know, croc. Um, went through a phase of a lot of weird aesthetics. And uh, I think that did was because of this time where we had all these new toys to play with and uh, and there were really not too many rules for them in the early 3D games. So yeah, I don't know. There's there's some level of, of the racing and platforming genres just being pretty darn unique in terms of their stories. I think it's cool that they, they are uh, really, really interlinked, but very different too in terms of the way the 2D, 3D affected them. Um, I think for that reason, I think the the fact that they were pretty purely just motion based just literally where your character is in space and then moving that thing meant that the 3d switch was huge um for them and opened up a lot of new avenues and you saw tons of different things happen um on both ends and they went in kind of opposite directions too which is interesting with the racing going far more the route of realism and then the uh the platformer games really not having that to lean on so they just kind of kept on iterating on different uh different mechanics different forms with a collectathon kind of becoming a thing um, really discovering new literal space, and uh, and yeah, I think I I'm interested to see how the next technological advancement, being VR, will be affecting both those genres again. So I think that pretty much sums it up for the uh, these two genres. At least, if you guys have any questions or thoughts or just egregious anger towards us for completely illegitimate reasons, that's fine. Um, you can shoot us a line at uh, Mark at Gaming Mechanics. Dot com or greg at gamemechanics.com and we will read those and respond extremely promptly. Um, <laughs> but past that, we are... Uh, Alarmingly promptly. We are... Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, frighteningly so. So, but, so we're going to be continuing our 3D uh, series next week. I uh, don't think we've decided on which genres we're going to do. I think shooters is going to be in general. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm also interested in talking about fighters, uh, and the way that got affected. And then uh, I think just in general, like adventure action games are really important to talk about too, like RPGs. So it'll be some combination of those. We'll probably continue to do multiple ones in one unless we get enough content, um, particular genre. But so the, this will continue through uh, through January at least. Um, and uh, and yeah, that's that's going to be the, the foreseeable future. I think streaming is also, I'm still out of a PC, although I am excitedly building a new one. Um, so I've Yay. begun that process of looking for parts and putting that together. It's the first time I've done this, so I'm super excited um, to not have to be using a seven-year-old MacBook um, to be doing anything. But until that happens again, streaming is probably going to be pretty difficult. Um, so look for that. Hopefully by February would be my guess. Um, and until next time, thank you for listening. And uh, this is Mark and uh, Anonymous Raccoon signing out. If you enjoyed this episode of Gaming Mechanics, check out our Twitter at Gaming Mechanics or our Facebook by going to facebook.com slash gaming mechanics. Thanks for listening.